Hello and welcome to My Security TV in our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the director with My Security Media. Uh, and today we're looking at smart factories and advanced manufacturing with uh, Dr. Jens Goneman, the managing director with the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre or the AMGC. Uh, Dr. Goneman is here in Sydney, uh, but we're obviously going to be looking at a national priority for manufacturing uh, and looking forward to this particular interview. And without further ado, we're going to dive into smart factories uh, and industry 4.0 with Dr. Jörns Gunnerman, Managing Director with the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre. Jörns, thank you for very much for joining us. Yeah, morning, Chris, and uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you. And uh, let me, in fact, uh, I will check that we are streaming. But um, if you don't mind, I think uh, pre-interview, we were talking about our, our sort of previous dealings with Cyber. So we have discussed sort of the government's innovation centres and the AMGC is one of those. Um, and you've been managing director since the start, 2016, 2017, um, I believe. So maybe introduce yourself and you've got a fascinating background, uh, but also uh, what the AMGC is up to as well. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, so the growth centres um, is an initiative starting in late 2015 and the idea back then uh, was to focus in Australia on what we are good at and instead of doing everything a little bit, um, we, are, we are trying to be very good um, and globally competitive in areas where we are already winners. So it's not about picking winners, it is about focusing what we have and be globally competitive and manufacturing as such as the capability which cuts across all the other sectors in which we are good. Hence, we not only have five and our six growth centers to start with, but now we have six national, wait for it, manufacturing priorities. So that's, I think, where we have changed the language on manufacturing, which is great. Now, we do have some slides to share and uh, we'll walk through them if you can. And you, you call this the smiley curve. Maybe talk us through this. And I think also you mentioned some 3,000 uh, within your uh, sort of group or member base. Maybe talk us about how, how you've scaled uh, since your launch. Yes, indeed. Look, um, there's a deeply wired misunderstanding in Australia what manufacturing is. And when we say manufacturing, uh, very often we only mean production, um, like for example, assembling cars. There is a difference from manufacturing cars, I can tell you that, and we all know how that has worked. So um, manufacturing is a process consisting of seven steps. Research and development, design, logistic, production, distribution, sales and services. So you look at Apple as an advanced manufacturer. Apple does all the smart stuff except the production part. They have outsourced it to Foxconn. Uh, in other words, the more value-adding parts of the manufacturing value chains happen before and after production. And this is where we need to see Australian manufacturers to pivot a word which I learned last year, and we can also see that almost now over half of the Australian um, manufacturing worker are working outside production already. And this is where the higher paying, more resilient jobs are, the jobs which make Australian manufacturers globally competitive, and we need to be better, not cheaper. Where would you say we're strongest here? Um, Manufacturing is a capability which cuts across all sectors and we can find in all sectors, wherever something is being made, something manufactured, we have in our network, we have now almost 3,000 members, um, we can find areas of excellence all over the place. What we lack in Australia is scale. We need to get our small uh, companies to go into global markets, be better, combine their efforts with, let's say, for example, in defense with global primes and uh, and embrace the strengths they have. I've just brought up the next slide, as you've kind of mentioned that in terms of the value add comes from making complex things. The yeah. changes in manufacturing and the technology, is it is it kind of cheaper to create a, a smart factory now in terms of 3D printing compared to the old industrial style? Well, whether it's smart and hard or not, we have no choice. Uh, we want to be better, not cheaper. And Australia as a country is not known to be having low wages. We have a certain standard of living. We cannot compete on cost. We need to compete on value. And um, the way you measure a country's capability to make complex things is measured in the so-called economic complexity index. 
that shows you what a country is capable of. And on the chart here on the left side, you see the higher the complexity a country can make, uh, the higher the income per capita. So you see logical, a logical correlation between low complexity, low income, and high complexity, high income. So on the upper right hand corner, you see all the countries who can make complex things like submarines. Now where is Australia? Australia sits in the high com income bracket, but in regards to complexity, Australia in the economic complexity index ranks between Burkina Faso and the Senegal. Now, that is because we do a lot of commodity extraction. We call it dig and ship and selling each other houses and have a service oriented um, and commodity oriented uh, economy. But what we don't do is manufacturing enough. We don't add value enough. And this is where you can see other countries who have also a lot of commodities like Canada and Norway, but they're moving to the right on the economic complexity index. And this is the journey Australia needs to go. Um, we consider manufacturing the most promising capability to transform a lucky country into a smart country. And in other words, adding value to commodities rather than dig and ship is called manufacturing. Well, we, we had a, we mentioned that pre-interview as well in terms of our raw resources and lithium batteries and lithium itself came up yesterday, uh, today, but also there was an announcement uh, yesterday from the Prime Minister, I think, uh, your colleague mentioned. So maybe just talk us through what we should be doing more of with our raw materials. Well, the Prime Minister um, announced um, um, a um, funding stream and an effort uh, with critical minerals, by the way, at a company site, Energy Renaissance it's called, and they do a project with ANGC. So well chosen place. Now, in regard to commodity extraction, uh, and in regards to critical minerals, uh, let's not repeat the mistake we have done with steel, uh, not even to speak about coal, because even if we have a lot of coal, nobody will buy that in 20 years because uh, fossils is not the future. So what we could do and should do and are on the way to do is um, instead of extracting lithium and send it elsewhere, mind you, lithium battery has 10 minerals and nine of them are be found in Australia. So we are in a unique position and by adding value to the commodities we have in excess and extract by adding value every value adding step which again is called manufacturing every adding step is a multiple of value um, than the previous one so extraction and two steps onshore would enable us to make much more out of our critical minerals and of our commodities than we've done in the past Okay, I, mean, I suppose that's economically, this is kind of brings up the next sort of slide as well in terms of what that can mean uh, for the country. And we, we, we covered this with um, semiconductors recently with the University of Sydney, and I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes with that in terms of the supply chain of things like semiconductors that, that should be manufactured or we could have sovereign capability to manufacture and the business case of that, uh, being able to supply raw materials through to manufacture, uh, how much more value add you get, and so much more. Where are we on this scale? Maybe explain through the, the sort of the job opportunities in this space as well. Well, last time I checked, we live in a capitalistic uh, system, and um, it works by you know, as long as you can pay your bills, you're in. If you can't, you're out. So we need to be competitive. We need to be able to make something what somebody else wants from us. Not just doing something because it is cool and we want to do it because other countries do it, like assembling cars. We have assembled cars for other countries, for Toyota, for General Motors, for Ford. But we have not been successful in that because otherwise we would have seen Holden's driving in Japan, in Germany and in the US like Toyota's, um, um, BMW's and Ford's driving in Australia. So that's not working. We need to be better. We need to be uh, embracing the entire value chain of manufacturing. The way we do that, um, and you can see that on the slide, um, we, we have done about 80 collaborative projects. That has cost the taxpayer nothing more than $90 million. But the companies we chose are the companies who advance the envelope, who are globally competitive, and who employ more people and have a product. We have manufacturers we do projects with, there are 20 people, but they export into 80 countries. And these projects, which demonstrate the research we have done, 
by being better, not cheaper, by um, embracing, the, embracing the entire smiley curve, by tapping into global markets with 6.5 billion customers and not 25 million customers. These are projects which create out of $90 million, 2,400 jobs. And um, that is an, a massive leverage for direct jobs. But every job in manufacturing creates more than three and a half times jobs in adjacent um, areas and they are indirect jobs. So we speak about eight and a half thousand jobs. These are the jobs which are resilient, which are higher paying, which are competitive. These are the jobs which stay. Do you, and again, we covered off uh, quite a bit on with Oz Cyber in this in terms of cyber security and skills development in that there's a bit of a skills challenge uh, perceived in, in cyber security. Uh, do you find the same thing in advanced manufacturing is then getting the skill sets and then making sure that our curriculum and our schools and our universities are producing industry ready uh, jobs or people ready for those? Let me, let me reframe that skill topic. Five years ago, people said, why are the heck do we need manufacturing? Um, and uh, the, the, the manufacturing question, the demand for manufacturing has completely changed. Suddenly, we have national manufacturing priorities. Now we're all going to be manufacturing, and I think that's great. So in that regard, we have changed the discussion, mission accomplished. Now we have people asking for more skills. Well, I think that's a good thing. I, I, that is a problem I like to have because if we have the demand for skills, the supply will follow. Just saying we throw more people on the market who have a STEM uh, degree and then don't have the demand of an employer who has hmm. globally competitive jobs to satisfy, to take that supply, it wouldn't work. So the supply of skill will follow. Yes, we need different curriculums. Yes, we need to attract young people into manufacturing. We need to attract them into STEM education. And by having a manufacturing capability and national manufacturing priorities in exciting areas like space, defense, recyclables, they are ticking, they are ticking all the boxes of what young people like you and I and even younger um, getting excited about. Where is it, while we're on the skills, question, is there any particular fields that are sort of leading the pack? Um, I mentioned we spoke about the rotating detonating engine. There's a whole range of sort of engineering skills in the background on that particular project. And just looking at the ones up on the screen here, is there any particular area, you know, what, what type of advice would you give for someone who's going, okay, advanced manufacturing, sort of advanced additive type uh, materials as well. There's a lot of science involved in this. Um, a profound, broad STEM education, you can't be wrong with that. Um, and uh, over a lifetime, the demands will change. So it will be a lifelong learning and um, be across the STEM areas you are uh, you're embracing. On. I wouldn't uh, put my uh, money on one over the other. And uh, look, I'm an economist, um, and for 25 years I didn't really use my studies. What was helpful for me is to use my uh, academic problem-solving skills. Um, and uh, uh, if you are STEM educated and you have an academic education, I would think with that understanding you're well placed. The difference a couple of years ago is simply that Australia. And a bit of thanks to COVID, but I think it also has to do that we have helped change the, the discussion about manufacturing and put it back on the map. This country wants to be a country which can make complex things. We want to be less dependent. We want to be better, not cheaper. And if you choose a career in that area, whether it's be an S, a T, a E, or an M, go for it. Fair enough. Well, let's, uh, before, while we're conscious of time, uh, and let's finish off on actually talking about some of the projects as well. And again, we, uh, and I recommend people go visit, uh, in fact, I'll put it in the notes now, but the amcg.org, amgc.org.au, uh, and I'll just stick that in there for anyone who wants to check it out. But there's a heap of projects on. And we've just uh, sort of nominated uh, four or five, and I can see uh, Gilmore Space and Black Sky uh, Aerospace is on there. Maybe talk us through that. We've had Gilmore Space on uh, previously, 
Um, how you would be assisting uh, sort of those companies there on, the, on their projects? Yeah. Look, um, the way we work is that we have thought about long and hard what makes Australian manufacturing competitive. And you know by now we have to be better, not cheaper. We embrace the entire value chain, not only focus on production. Um, and we have demonstrated that in our projects. We have done projects around 80 with probably two, 300 companies and with research partners research partner who solved an industry problem, not industry solving the funding problem, mind you. And that are great examples, but 80 projects with a couple of hundred companies does not change the nation. This is why we also advocate on our manufacturing academy, on our website, how good looks like. So we have research um, examples, but we have also the project examples. And because of the capability in coming across all mm. the sectors and something being made, you will most certainly find one or two or three projects out of the 80 which are close to home and relevant for your field, for your company. And this is how we try to scale and get into the head of the other 47,000 manufacturers out there in Australia so that they can also follow the path and not think they can win the prize by being cost competitive. Um, they need to be better, they need to be globally competitive and enter into these markets. Maybe just these um, the miniature thermoelastic stress analysis camera, uh, and again maybe just going one step back on that is how do you assist? Are you assisting? Is it funding as well that you provide some of these? Is it sort of that industry connection to say, hey, have you thought about this form that you could go on? Or companies might come to you and say, we need we're going to produce a new product, but we need. A different material. How, how, how do you actually assist? In the last three years we had 90 million dollars and put it in little chunks with 80 projects and now we have another 30 million dollars which will be spent within the six national manufacturing priorities and that's a broad church so they are um, the, 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 the six priorities are space, defense, medical, food and beverage, critical minerals, renewables and recyclables. And uh, now if you're not a space company, or well, let me give you an example, we had a watchmaker, um, which was the only company in Australia, which is certainly not a space company, but it was the only company who could make a widget for a microsatellite because they have the machinery. And uh, so don't be shy to be outside of a national manufacturing priority as long as you can make a project you can deliver or advance a national manufacturing priority. So we have another 30 million on the start. The way we do projects, we match funding dollar for dollar in cash. And this dollar for dollar in cash means that we break a project down in milestones and we give you the money in advance. Actually, half of it is your money and half of it is ours. <laughs> and once the project is accomplished, we in fact check homework. So we want to see whether the project goes in the right direction. And this is why the projects are so impactful that we make with little, relatively little money, very competent project participants, we can we can create so many new jobs and can be so competitive. Very um, good. And it's a $1.5 billion funded national manufacturing strategy and initiative. So watch that space. We have also funding opportunities going online one after the other. Yesterday about critical minerals, before that in medical, and before that in space, for projects between one and $20 million which you also need to match one by one. So there's money out there. You need to put the money where the mouse is and, uh, and match the dollar for dollar. But that is the change of landscape uh, in manufacturing. Okay, so we've got still got five or so minutes, uh, Jens, and let's walk through these projects. And this is the one that actually kicked it off uh, that came across my desk uh, yep. and the Industry 4.0 project and developing a smart factory. Uh, talk us through uh, uh, Redark. Was it Redark? Yeah. Redark. Redark, what a, what a uh, uh, showcase for manufacturing Australia. Redark had a product line of one uh, 25 years ago. Now they have 600 different products. Um, they make vehicle electronics, wherever there's a battery in it, Redark sees the market. So what we see here is an automatic brake controller by the way, I have one, works fantastically. Uh, but what I didn't know is that this um, brake controller um, is assembled. Remember the smiley curve, the middle part, 
is assembled by cobots. So what does it mean? It means that a dull part, which or dull process, we say in Australia we are too expensive for that, has been outsourced to a brother or sister a cobot. Why a cobot? Because the difference between a robot and a cobot is a robot wipes you out when you come too close and has to be in a fence and in, in a cage. A cobot works alongside and um, I've tested myself if uh, uh, you come too close it stops. So it is right on the factory floor and in the smiley curve of manufacturing process it does the assembly um, instead of a human. Now people say automation robots lead to lo jobs and losses. Couldn't be further from the truth. The only jobs which are lost are in China. Our workforce is upskilled, programs, works with the cobots. Every project we do with automation and robots has created new work. So there are two myths to bust today. Manufacturing is more than production and automation creates jobs. It doesn't take jobs away. Very good. And are they universal robots in the background there? There's the main arm. Let's say again. Are they universal robots? They are universal robots and yep. uh, there are three cobots in that station and uh, the, uh, the workforce uh, has programmed them in a way uh, to adapt them to um, their, 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 their needs. Fantastic, uh, fantastic setup. Okay, and this one looked interesting too. Uh, visual stress monitoring and uh, it's, we, we're manufacturing this camera, are we? I'd like, like to see Australia manufacturing a camera. Uh, that is true, and it's a spin-off from the Australian Defence Department. Uh, very often defence, uh, and we have, as we all know, massive defence procurements, which turns into massive onshore manufacturing uh, opportunities. So that is a spin-off, um, and this camera does the uh, um, testing of stress and structures in a non-destructive way, and uh, is uh, something what also can pivot outside of defence to uh, check structures, uh, for example, yeah, structures under under stress, such as aircraft wings, but also bridges. Nice, and I think we, I did get the media release on this. I think it's on our CTV buyers guide uh, as well. This one I looked at uh, a while ago as well, and this is Sharon Advanced Training Armor, and this is something that Eric might like in terms of his virtual reality training. Uh, I imagine you might be able to stick on this type of uh, armor, advanced training armor, you can start hitting, hitting them over the head, right? Yes. <laughs> the idea? Uh, it, uh, that is an um, interesting project as well. Um, you know, you, you know the, the saying, train as you fight. And um, if you have an armor like that, uh, you actually can. You can, in fact, do this with lesser um, uh, safe armor or without, but you can only do it one time. So with this one, um, you can repetitive train as you fight and um, the, um, uh, has revolutionized not only the training for, let's say, defense and police forces, but has also um, was making its way into um, the civil market. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, is that, I, I don't know, that's, um, I know, I think it was Lockheed Martin are putting on some advanced body armor for soldiers and the like. I don't know if it's related to that, but it looks very interesting. I think we might reach out to Sharon. Uh, and uh, get them to walk us through that. Very interesting. And I think the last one is Black Sky Aerospace, uh, solid state rocket fuel. This is obviously for our space and defense channel. Indeed, like um, the idea, you know, there are two types of uh, rocket fuels, the liquid ones where you have to have a fuel and an oxidizer, and um, which has advantages and disadvantages, and one disadvantage is the storage. Um, with the solid state rocket fuel, um, you can basically, for a very long time, store it, and uh, we see solid-state rocket fuels often in combination with uh, liquid fuels, take the space shuttle, the boosters, and uh, solid fuel, and, um, and the, uh, the big tank under the space shuttle was liquid fuel. So, has, um, the, the idea here is that, and the project we did with them, like every project you mentioned, uh, be Meli Calvin or Red Ark or Sharon, are all aimed to see uh, collaborative projects, usually where we give in half the money and where the research partner and other companies to participate. In case of Black Sky Aerospace, the outcome is that we establish a sovereign manufacturing capability for solid state um, fuel and rockets. And that is a nice thing to add. Um, we see uh, military applications and we see civil applications. Now, Very we're not good. 
against uh, NASA and not against Elon Musk. We, we, these companies looking for a segment for an even cheaper way for lower payload into space. And as we see, microsatellites are the way to go, and they don't weigh much. Uh, they are basically a hard shoebox. So that's what we can do from Australia. How much activity are you seeing in the space industry as part of your cohort? Maybe break it down into a percentage, because space, obviously, uh, for us, it's getting much more interesting and uh, much easier to reach out to people in the industry as well. Well, in the early days of um, um, the growth centres, I've propagated that defence needs to be the growth centre type of a priority, and then we got the space agency. Here we go. Now we have six national manufacturing priorities, four of them are covered by growth centers and two come online as well. Space is, despite defense with all the onshore manufacturing space and how that ripples into the civil market and creates great jobs and gives us the ability to sustain and upgrade the defense procurements. Space is the same. Space is an exciting industry which attracts a lot of people um, space has a lot of applications beyond space, doesn't only push the envelope of um, the space sector as such, but all a lot of adjacent sectors in which complicated things are being manufactured will benefit from that. So space is a great opportunity for Australia. Absolutely. And I think maybe let's just finish off on the language, uh, Jens, in terms of manufacturing is not a, a sector. You, you're describing it as a capability. Uh, maybe just finish off with how that terminology is now quite important. It is um, because by looking at a sector, we uh, would only very narrowly look at a production part, but you all know now with the smiley curve that manufacturing consists out of seven steps. And wherever something is being made, preferably something complex, something globally competitive, wherever something is being made, that is manufacturing. So we make a vaccine. Is it the health sector or is it manufacturing? In fact, it's both. And that is the capability we need to have. And we could demonstrate during COVID that manufacturers in our network were able to not talk about ventilators, but they were able to build 1,700 invasive ventilators from scratch, 99.3% sourced out of Australia. That's manufacturing for you. Very good. Well, look, uh, we could have gone for another hour as well. And what we haven't spoken about is your skydiving uh, exploits as well. Uh, <laughs> let me just, uh, just, just to finish off uh, for the audience, uh, Dr. Jens Goneman uh, is also an avid skydiver. And uh, as long as, uh, along with having a PhD in economics from the University of Hamburg and a Bachelor of Business uh, from the Hamburg School of Business Administration, uh, he's the chairman of the German-Australian Chamber of Commerce, a senior member of the Executive Committee for Industry 4.0 Advanced Manufacturing Forum, a board member of the Innovative Manufacturing CRC, a fellow of the Australian Institute Company Directors and played a key role in the Prime Minister's National COVID-19 Coordination Commission Chris, Manufacturing Task Force. All I need to know that, the only thing people need to remember is manufacturing and production are not the same and manufacturing is a capability, all the other things you can forget. I love it. Well, look, I'm going to your your profile. I can't do the whole profile, and I was trying to find the uh, the skydiving record uh, that you uh, broke in October 2014. Uh, I'll have that in the notes. Uh, and uh, very impressive uh, background as well. So thank you, Dr. Jens Goneman. Thanks for having me. Thanks for Good man. Thanks. I'll put you backstage, Jens, and enjoy your day. Likewise. Bye. Okay, very, very good. And like I said, uh, avid skydiver, and uh, he is the triple Australian four-way formation skydiving champion. That's what I was looking for. And was among the 214 German skydivers who leapt into history, uh, 18 and a half thousand feet above the Arizona desert. So very good.